The Arm of the Starfish by Madeline Lengel, 24. In the morning, Polly brought Adam his breakfast. She put the tray down on the bed and then stood looking at him steadily, and, it seemed to him, accusingly, he had been weighed again and found wanting. But when she spoke, she said only, Adam, and then, Adam, I do love you, and I'm terribly sorry. At the door, she said in a muffled voice, Daddy and Father expect you in the lab as soon as you're ready. The lab? Adam asked stupidly. Polly ran her fingers with impatience through her hair. The starfish have to be tended to. Daddy's work doesn't stop because... She broke off. A tremor moved across her face like the wind moving upon water. She stamped angrily to regain control. Why do you think Joshua went rushing off to you when Callie called him? You don't think he thought it was fun and games and the good and the good of his health, did you? Or do you? Adam shook his head. All right, why then? Adam banged down his cup. Starfish and sparrows, he said loudly. Polly stamped again. Okay, then, and hurried out of the room. Adam finished the cup of now lukewarm coffee, poured another, drinking slowly, unwilling to leave what seemed the comparative safety of his room. Seeing Polly had been bad enough, he wanted to put off seeing anyone else. Slowly, deliberately, he drained the last drops of coffee and milk from the little pots, picked up each crumb of his roll and ate it. Finally, there was nothing to do but get dressed, and since his lab clothes were nothing but chino slacks and a t-shirt, he could not prolong the process by more than a few minutes. Then he almost ran through the living room, hurried across the breezeway, and into the lab. Dr. O'Keefe and Tent Can and Talis were standing by one of the tanks. Dr. O'Keefe beckoned to him. Look at this, Adam. This is a tiny fragment of star this is the tiny fragment of starfish arm we planted with nerve rings several weeks ago. Yesterday I'd about given up on it, but look, there's regeneration beginning. Check the other tanks, will you please, and let me know if there's anything unusual. Nobody was behaving as though it were an ordinary day, but nevertheless the work in the laboratory was going on, and this was still a shock to Adam. He took care of the starfish, pointed out new growth on a lizard, wrote up his notes in the files. He worked automatically, adequately, but his mind was no longer out of time as it had been the night before. He was thrust back into time and therefore into pain. This time, the day before, the day before Joshua had been alive. In the short space of 24 hours, more had happened than it would seem time possibly could take care of. And time hadn't taken care of it. Molech's bullet had sped through space and time and into Joshua's heart. Adam... Canon Talis said. Will you go over these figures, please? <clears throat> these are from Scotland, and we want to see if they jibe with Dr. O'Keefe's findings. Sit down to it, Dr. O'Keefe suggested, as Adam took the sheaf of papers. It's important you check them accurately. You'll find the equations perfectly straightforward, but you'll have to concentrate if you don't want to make errors. We'll see you later. All right, sir. Adam had not wanted to come into the lab to see Dr. O'Keefe and Canon Talis. Now he did not want them to leave, but they went out without telling him where they were going, perhaps to the village to see Verbius or to check the pens there. He did not know. He concentrated on the letters and numbers written in black ink on thin paper. He found that if he was going to check them properly, he could not think about anything else. At first, it was an effort to pay attention to what he was doing then. To what he was doing then, as always, the discipline of work took hold of him, and he bent over the papers, his lips moving. His bruised mind occupied only with the job Canon Talis had given him. He was surprised when Peggy came to call him, hugging him, twinning her arms about him lovingly, kissing him over and over again, but not speaking, not explaining the sudden passion of affection. Mrs. O'Keefe stood in the lab doorway. Have a quick swim before lunch, Adam. The children are looking for you. Adam changed the navy blue trunks trying not to look at the zebra-striped ones. The children were waiting for him on the sea wall. Polly wore a red bathing suit, but the color seemed drained from it. Polly wore the red bathing suit, but the color seemed drained from it. From her hair, there was no running and jumping over the sand, no delighted leaping into the surf. Peggy held Adam's hand. When she was ankle deep, she let go, saying, I don't think I'll go swimming today if you don't mind, Adam. I want to go back in with Johnny and Rosie. Sandy and Denny's sat at the water's edge, letting small waves wash over them, letting the damp yellow sand shift through their fingers, talking only to each other. Polly said, if you'll come with me, Adam, I want to swim out a bit. I'll come, too. Charles moved to Adam's other side. 
The three of them walked out into the water, not jumping through the waves, simply pushing against them, letting the water break unheeded over them, until they were out deep enough so that first Charles could drop down and start to swim, then Polly and Adam. He did not ask about Macrina. After a while, he said, that's far out, that's far enough out, Polly, and obediently she stopped swimming and began to tread water. She did not make the breathy, whistling noises with which she usually called Macrina. She simply kept treading water and staring out to sea. Charles lay on his back and floated, his eyes closed against the glare of the sun. Adam dog paddled between them. He was about to say, okay, kids, we better go back in, when there was a familiar flash of silver and Macrina was with them. Polly gave a great cry and flung herself at the dolphin. Charles continued to lie on his back in the water, his eyes closed. Polly's sobs were enormous, racking the thin body in the red wool bathing suit. For a moment, Macrina thrashed the water with her tail. Then she gave a shudder and swam slowly around Polly, keeping her head with, great smiling, with the great smiling mouth constantly toward the child. The mouth was smiling, but there was no doubt in Adam's mind that Macrina, now nuzzling Polly's shoulder, was trying to comfort the child, that Macrina cared. Then the dolphin left Polly and swam over to Charles, nudging him gently until he opened his eyes, rolled over in the water, flung his arms around the and flung his arms around the great slippery body. When Charles let Macrina go, she came to Adam, seeming to look at him questioningly. Then, with a flash of silver, she was gone. The children swam in. Come on, Sandy, Denny's, Polly said to the two little boys who were building a sand castle. As they walked... across the burning beach to the bungalow, Polly murmured, she's not an anthropomorphic dolphin. She's an, anag she's an anagogical dolphin. Huh? Adam asked. I don't know what it means. It's something Father Tom, Tom once said, and I made him say it over until I remembered about, or until I remember it. I think it's something good. Ken and Talis and Dr. O'Keefe were down at lunch. The younger children chatted desultorily. Adam tried to choke down a few mouthfuls because Charles was looking at him, and when Adam took a bite, Charles took a bite. Once Mrs. O'Keefe turned to Adam, saying in a steady voice, the Cutters are at the hotel, Adam. They'll be flying to Spain from here, and then to America. My husband and father, Talis, will go over tonight to get your passport. Adam bowed his head to show that he had heard and took another bite. Mrs. O'Keefe rose. Do whatever Maria tells you two children. I won't be gone long. Adam, Polly, Charles, come. It was only then, then, that Adam noticed Polly and Charles had changed from their bathing suits to their riding breeches. Mrs. O'Keefe said, Maria has laid out your riding clothes for you, Adam. We'll wait outside. The riding breeches Joshua had given Adam the first night on the island were on his bed. Together with a clean white shirt, wine carefully placed on the shirt was the canvas belt with the switchblade knife containing the lethal dose of MS-222. Adam looked at the knife broodingly. Had Maria put it there? Had Polly? He stripped off his lab clothes and strapped the knife on under the riding clothes. Polly led the way inland. Since her storm of sobbing on the o in the ocean and the silent comfort of the dolphin, she seemed less tightly drawn. As the horses began to climb, Adam realized that they were going to the great golden stones where Joshua had taken him the morning he had arrived on the island, the morning he had failed to notice the small cemetery in the clearing. When they reached the plateau, there were several boys from the village waiting to take care of the horses and Adam saw that there were already other horses around. Around the great table was a large group of people, some seated on stones, more standing, a few of them Adam recognized. Verbius was there with Temis. Rabbi Pinhas was there. And Mr. Green, Father Matosis, and Archangelo. Was the inspector from the Madrid airport sitting on one of the stones by the young taxi driver? Their faces were turned away. He could not be sure. Ken and Talis held the burial service. Adam had heard the words before, for his grandparents, for a teacher at school. It was the English words which the canon was using for Joshua. Now the words seemed tangible, material, steeled by the English voice. They held him erect on the stone bench where he sat between Polly and Charles. Remember thy servant, Joshua, O Lord, Canon Talus said, according to the favour which thou bearest unto thy people, and grant that, increasing in knowledge and love of thee, 
he may go from strength to strength in a life of perfect service. Charles reached over and took Adam's cold hand in his smaller but equally cold one. Unto God's gracious mercy and protection we commit you, Canon Talis said. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace both now and evermore. They moved from the golden stones across the rough grass and into the clearing where the open grave waited. Charles continued to hold Adam's hand. Once he pressed his face against Adam's shirt, then he turned and looked back at Canon Talus on Adam's other side. Polly stood still as death. Adam closed his eyes. It was over. The group disappeared quietly. It was only as Adam went with Charles to the horses, where Dr. and Mrs. O'Keefe stood waiting with Canon Tallis, that he realized that Polly had gone from his side, that she was nowhere to be seen. <coughs> Excuse me. Stay with Charles, the doctor said. We'll look for her. They waited, and Charles said only, Don't worry, Adam. Polly's all right. When Dr. O'Keefe and Canon Tallis returned alone, Charles said without anxiety, I think she's gone to the village with Temis. She has to be away from us for a little while. Mrs. O'Keefe looked at her husband. Will you ride over and see? The doctor nodded. Tom, come with me. She may need you. Now there were just the three of them on the plateau. Adam, Mrs. O'Keefe, and Charles. And to one side, two little village boys staying faithfully with the horses. Adam asked Mrs. O'Keefe, Would you and Charles be all right if I rode over to the hotel? I'd like to get my passport back myself. She looked at him. If this is what you think you want to do, Adam, Charles and I will be fine in any case, but please be home in time for dinner. Adam agreed absently. He was not thinking of dinner. As he rode toward the hotel darkness, as he rode toward the, ho toward the hotel, darkness closed in on him again. He did not see the sun or even feel its rays, although he frequently raised his arm to wipe off the sweat that streamed down his face. He rode through darkness and through time. The sun was slipping down toward the west when the path opened out between the hotel landing strip and the tennis court and swimming pool. He did not know what he was going to do or say when he saw Typhon Cutter and Kali. He was not thinking primarily about his passport. This would be easy enough for Dr. O'Keefe and Canon Tallis to get. He only knew that the anger that burned in him would not abate until he had seen Kali. Kali, who had, des who had deliberately led him into the killing of the Sao Juan Chrysostom Monastery, her high, shrill laugh echoed in his ears. He hitched the tired white horse to a tree at the end of the path, walked past the landing strip toward the beach, up the path between, the tennis, co between tennis courts and swimming pool, glancing at the courts where two potchy men were playing. The pool was emptying. Only a handful of young people remained splashing in the water, were sitting on the sides of the pool, dangling their legs and sipping cokes. He almost walked by without seeing a girl in a black bathing suit, sitting alone on the diving board. Her head was down on her knees, and her fair hair fell in a graceful sweep across her face. He went up to her. Kali! She raised her head. When she saw him, her eyes widened, but she did not move. What do you want? My passport. She rose to her feet in a quick, lithe gesture. Catch me and I'll give it to you, she cried and gave her high-pitched laugh, which rose shrilly, almost into hysteria. She dived cleanly into the water, flashed to the end of the pool, climbed up the ladder, ran along the path, down the ramp, and across the beach. Adam following, losing ground, hampered by his riding breeches, his, his boots. Kali ran, splashing into the water. Looking back over her shoulder, laughing, she dove through a wave and started to swim. Adam pulled off his boots, his trousers, ripped off his shirt, and in underclothes and Polly's canvas belt, he ran into the sea, fleeing himself against the waves, thrusting through the breakers until he could throw himself down and swim. He looked up, panting to see Kali's arms flashing through the water ahead of him. Each time he looked, she was less far ahead. Then he heard her scream. His first thought was that it was Macrina. But the second scream that rang across the water was one of mortal terror. He saw the shark, the sleek, malevolent body in murky darkness, unable to leap to a flash of silver. It's only light, a sickly white, the sickly light of its belly. The shark would do the shark would do for him more than he dared to hope to do. 
Adam! The scream throbbed against his ears. He snatched the knife from the sheath, gave a mighty kick that shot him through the water toward the screaming girl, and plunged the knife into the shark. There was blood in the water, Collie's blood, but the shark was still. Adam took Collie in one arm hold and started to swim to the shore. She was limp in his grasp, although an occasional scream bubbled from her lips. When he could stand, he picked her up. Her arm was ripped and bleeding copiously. He put her down at the water's edge, where loose sand would not get into the wounds, and picked up his shirt from the beach, ripping the white material so that he could wrap it around her arm and to staunch the blood. He carried her to the hotel. She was sobbing and beginning to writhe in his arms. He felt neither hate nor love toward her, only an infinite weariness, as though she were a tremendous burden he despaired of ever being able to put down. He tried not to think of the horribly ripped arm. He endured grimly the clamor of excitement and curiosity that greeted their entrance, pushing blindly through the avid guests toward the elevator, calling, the, do the doctor, quickly. The hotel manager rushed after him, wringing pudgy hands. But what is it? What has happened? Shark, Adam said grittily. Get her father. Get a doctor. In a luxurious room, he put her down on the bed. She was white from shock. Her head moved feebly on the pillow. Adam, Adam, help. Typhon Cutter and the doctor arrived together. What have you done to her? Typhon Cutter asked. Face contorted with his accusation, Adam did not answer. He said it was a shark, the manager babbled. But it couldn't have been a shark. It's not possible that it was a shark. The doctor undid the bandage. Adam had made, looked at Callie's arm. A shark, he stated categorically. Get me blankets. Get me hot water bottles. He opened his bag and began to work the, over the girl. Typhon Cutter watched sickly. The room was silent, except for the movements of the doctor and the sound of the surf outside. The flesh of Typhon Cutter's face had gone greenish and seemed to sag. In the ocean? Yes, Adam said. Why? She, she, knows, she knows I have forbidden... I asked her for my passport, and she said, catch me. You know how quick she is. Yes. The older man's eyes were focused on the girl on the bed, on the doctor's actions. Then I hadn't quite caught up with her when I heard her scream. The shark had attacked her? Yes. How did she get away? Adam took off the canvas belt and the sheath. I had a switchblade with MS-222. What? It knocks a shark out faster than anything else. You used it to save her? There was scorn and disbelief in the voice. Yes. Where is the knife? In the shark. Adam, feeling sick, through with questioning. Through with the cutters forever, stared at the door. Typhon Cutter's steel talon shot out and clamped over his arm. Wait. A lock of fair hair fell unheeded over the older man's forearm, still holding Adam. She, he asked the doctor, the arm? Bad. It were not for the young man and his quick action, you would have no daughter at all. What about the arm? The doctor shrugged. There is much damage. A shark's teeth are deadly. You're sure it was, a, it was a shark? The doctor shrugged again. I have seen shark bites before, there is no question. Typhon Cutter, pulling Adam with him, leaned over the bed. What are we going to do? There is little I can do except stop the bleeding and shock. You will have to get her to Lisbon, but even there, again the expressive lifting of the shoulder. Typhon Cutter jerked his head at the manager. Come! Not relaxing his painful clamp on Adam's arm, he went into the corridor. A police officer was waiting outside the door with the hotel detective. Cutter ignored them, although they bowed respectfully, and the detective started to murmur expressions of alarm and concern. Get O'Keefe, Typhon Cutter said to Adam. As Adam did not reply, the talons increased their pressure. I said get O'Keefe! Why? Adam asked, beyond caring what he said or did. Fool, do you think I don't know what he has worked on human beings in his state in the native village? Go to the telephone. Get him to come. He will do it for you. I will send the helicopter. There was anger in his voice, command in the words, naked pleading in the eyes. Another strand of pale gold hair fell forward unheeded. I'll call, Adam said, but he may not be there. The private line in your office. Cutter snapped at the manager. They went down the hall into the elevator, through the lobby, the oily little manager, the uniformed police officer, the detective still ignored, Cutter, his ponderous body quivering, Adam, in the lobby, the guests were milling around. But her arm was ripped off, I saw it. 
She'll bleed to death before anything could be done. Nonsense, it was only a scratch, they said so. It wasn't her arm, it was her leg, the police officer shouted for quiet. Please do not concern yourself. The girl is all right. She disobeyed rules by swimming in the ocean when the lifeguard was not there. She would never have been allowed to go out so far. If you would be sensible, there is no danger whatsoever. The manager echoed him, wringing his hands anxiously. Everything is all right. There is no cause for alarm. She went out too far. He scurried around to Adam, grasped his hand in an effusion of gratitude. My dear young man, fool, come, Cutter said. The manager put the call through. Charles answered the phone, called his mother. It's Adam. Yes, Mrs. O'Keefe said. What is it, Adam? Is the doctor there? No, he's in the village with Polly and Father Talis. What is it? What happened? Can I help? Callie has been hurt by a shark. Do you know when they'll be back? Sometime this evening. I don't know when. Adam, are you all right? The warmth and concern in her voice shook Adam so that he had to lean on the desk for support. But he said, I'm fine, and I'll be home as soon as I can. Cutter, who was breathing heavily behind him, said as he hung up, in the village? Yes. Cutter snapped at the manager. Get the helicopter ready to Adam. Go to the village and get him. The police officer held up his hand, speaking to Adam. There will have to be a statement from you. The detective finally got in, in a word to absolve the hotel of any blame. Typhon Cutter's thin voice rose in an angry squeak. I am the hotel. There is no question of blame. She broke hotel rules, my rules. Controlling a soar the soaring pitch of his voice, he asked Adam, Why did you have this stuff, whatever it was, whatever it is on you? You know there have been sharks here. I had the knife with me when Callie asked, when Callie and I saw the shark before. The phone on the manager's desk rang and Cutter pushed the little man aside to reach for it. Yes, yes, he put the receiver down. The helicopter is ready. Bring O'Keefe to her. Adam said humbly, I'll try. You will do more than try. I'll go with you. No, Adam's voice was firm. I'll go alone. Stay with Kali. She may need you. For a moment, Typhon Cutter chewed his lip. Very well. The pilot is one of my men. If O'Keefe doesn't come, he will have my instructions to Adam cut through the threat by walking deliberately past Typhon Cutter and out of the manager's office. Again, the procession moved through the lounge. Adam, silent, closed in, indifferent to the curiosity, the manager and the detective responding exactly to the excitedly to the heightening tension of the guests, assuring them that all was well. Everything was perfect. The young man was a hero. The helicopter waited on the roof. The manager pumped Adam's hand. Thank you. Mutio abrigado. Thank you. The boy started to climb into the helicopter. He paused. My passport. Typhon Cutter said, When you send O'Keefe back, no more of that now. Adam stood his ground, staring at Cutter's ravaged face. Do you want Dr. O'Keefe? The manager, the detective, and the police officer murmured. Typhon Cutter reached into his breast pocket and handed over the passport. Adam climbed into the helicopter. He did not look back. Not in time, not in space. His mind was exhausted to the point where it was bliss to allow it to drift. With the noise of the rotors. <coughs> to relax in the silence of the pilot. When the helicopter hovered over the village, Adam looked down and saw a scurrying of dark shapes. The village emptied, men and women disappearing into the jungle, into the huts. The pilot set the machine down on the greensward in front of the central hut. As Adam climbed out, he saw the pilot reaching for his gun, but he felt no fear. Verbius emerged from his hut, raising his hand in greeting. Adam, too, raised his hand. Is Dr. O'Keefe here? The old man spoke slowly, tremulously, with great effort. You wish speak? Please. The old man beckoned, and Dr. O'Keefe and Canon Talis came out of the hut. Dr. O'Keefe, bending his tall frame to pass through the doorway as Adam started to speak, Dr. O'Keefe called, Polly, and she came out with Temis. Adam told them what had happened, while Polly translated for Verbius and Temis. When the boy had finished, Dr. O'Keefe questioned him, then stood as though still listening. Then he looked at Canon Talis, and their eyes met for a long moment. Dr. O'Keefe nodded. Daddy, Polly cried. You're not going. Yes, I will have to see the arm for myself. Then, if it is as bad as it seems, I will have to tell Typhon Cutter of the dangers. And then, if he still wishes me to, I will try. Polly ran to her father and caught his hands in hers. But you wouldn't try if you didn't think you could do it, would you? No. But why are you going, Daddy? Why? 
Canon Talus drew Polly away from her father. Ask Adam why, Polly. But she was silent. They stood looking while Dr. O'Keefe climbed into the helicopter, still stood looking by half, still stood looking half deafened by the noise of the rotors until it had droned away, until the night sounds of the village could be heard again. Without a word, Verbia sat on the greensward, cross-legged, looking out at the harbor. Canon Talus sat by him, gesturing to Adam. The two girls stood together, facing the men. Tennis raised her hand, looked at the spread-out figures, dropped it to her side. Verbia spoke. Polly said, He wants to know to know if you think Daddy did right to go. Adam, Canon Talus said. Adam was silent, looking at the village, at the men returning from the jungle, at the women and children emerging from their huts. Evening was coming quickly. The sun had already dropped with the sudden fierceness of the jungle, and the sky over the island was suffused with great streaks of color, rose, raspberry, deepening to mauve, to indigo. Above a date palm, a star began to pulse, at first faintly, then growing in bril brilliance. In the darkness of the surrounding brush, fireflies flickered. Adam? Canon Talus asked again. I think he had to go, Adam said unwillingly. He began to shiver and realized that, like it or not, he would again be able to feel heat and cold, sunlight and moonlight. At a word from the old man, Temis slipped into the hut. But why? Polly demanded passionately. Why did he have to go? Adam was silent while Temis came out and draped a softly woven robe over, the, over him. Then he said hoarsely, because of Joshua. But she killed Joshua, Polly cried. Why should Daddy help her now? I don't want to help her, Adam. Why should you... I don't want to help her. Adam should have let that shark kill her. Adam was silent. Father, Polly cried. Canon Talis said quietly. Suppose it had been Adam the shock attacked. Tears began to roll down Polly's cheeks. But Adam's good and she is... Adam stood up, holding Temis's robe about his shoulders. He could not say what he had to say sitting down. I killed Joshua too. But be quiet, Polly. Canon Talis com commanded. Adam let the robe drop as he clenched and unclenched his fists. If I hadn't used the knife, or if we didn't try to help Kali now, it would be justice, wouldn't it? Verbius nodded, saying the English word justice, nodding again. But Joshua! But Joshua, Adam said. Joshua, he broke off. It's Joshua I'm thinking about, Polly cried. It's what he always said, Adam choked out, about the sparrow. Even Kali would be a sparrow to Joshua. If you're going to care about the fall of the sparrow, you can't pick and choose who's going to be the sparrow. It's everybody and you're stuck with it. He sat down and put his arms about his knees and his head on his ar in his arms. Verbia spoke. When he had finished, there was silence until he spoke again, rather crossly to Polly as she translated. He says it is not enough if you pray neither for nor against. He says he will go to his gods and pray for. Verbia stood up tremulously and went into his hut. Adam did not know how long he sat there with his head down. When he looked up, Temis had gone and Polly had turned away. Canon Talus looked at Adam, smiled briefly, but did not speak. Night was coming. But to Adam, he returned. The canon smile everywhere there seemed to be light. At last, Polly reached over and took his hand in hers. I see that Daddy had to go, she said, and then, I love you, Adam. He held her hand tightly. I love you too, Polly. And that is the end of The Arm of the Starfish.